Hello, my name is Chris Lindsay, and you're watching the Maturing Your Application Security Program. We are joining today, Johnny, and doing a webinar uh, with Invicti and Mint combined. Johnny, please introduce yourself. Hi, Chris. Hi, I'm Johnny Stewart. I head up product management over at Invicti Security. So really looking forward to short webinar with uh, everyone from Mend. Good. And my name is Chris Lindsay. I am an application security evangelist for Mend. Uh, my job is to speak at conferences, do webinars, and share the good news of uh, application security. So with that being said, uh, in 2023, 71% of the enterprises admitted their application security programs were reactive, playing catch up with uh, vulnerability alerts. Johnny, you have anything you want to throw in there? Yeah, it's super interesting. So we'd seen um, a similar report uh, published from Invicti last year called the AppSec Indicator Report. And it kind of saw a lot of the data that teams were trying to catch up with their vulnerability alerts is just so much alert fatigue these days. Um kind of the, there's a real need to kind of focus in on the what's not noise and focus on real sort of true positives that are actually going to put your organization at risk. So that's kind of um I'm not surprised it might even be higher than that, Chris, higher than 71% maybe. Yes. Yes. All right. Johnny, you yes, want to talk about this, this slide? This is actually, absolutely. So this is actually just one graph out of that report, that AppSec indicator report. But the reason we put this uh, graph on a slide really shows the big difference between what we would call severes, so criticals and high vulnerabilities, which is the two sort of sets of bars on the left, um, against the medium and the lows, which, which are on the right. And you can just see how high they are. Um, this would kind of indicate that people are addressing criticals and people are addressing their highs. So year by year, you can kind of see most recently that the those sort of severe vulnerabilities dipped um, in the amount of scans we find them in. And this data is is really really broad. So this is based on um, but one thousand seven hundred customers probably tens of thousands of web apps and I think it's close to close to two million uh scans. So you can kind of see that really shows you that that uh backs up the report there from men.io that the 71% are drowning in alerts. Yes. And we are seeing the same thing yes. too with our data, looking at the different programs. They are focused on the criticals. They are focused on the highs. They are bumping them down. They're, they are making progress. Um, but with the mediums and the lows and informationals, we're, we're seeing a uh, very same thing where uh, they're not being tended to as much. And you know, one thing I want to bring up on this page is just make sure that when, when you're focused on your program, you know, criticals and highs are absolutely where you should be focused uh, initially, but do not overlook the the uh, the mediums and the lows because there could be hidden nuggets in there that could be uh, negatively impacting your your uh, your program. And uh, you know, yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, it. go ahead. Yeah, no, just say the unfortunate part of that, Chris, when you mentioned the mediums and the lows, is that easily they can be string them together. Um, can I was because we spoke about this one time before, Chris, where they might be a medium and low to start with, but when you combine sort of two or three mediums or lows, one might give you access, and then another one gets you a little bit further, and the last one lets you get the data that you wanted. So the medium and lows are still certainly the mediums are still worth addressing. Um, as you mature your AppSec program, you need to kind of start looking at the mediums, but. Totally agree, Chris. Like you do have to start with the criticals and mediums, or the criticals and highs. You do have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing when I ran my program years ago, uh, one of the things that I focused on was was coming up with an OKR that would be something that would help drive down the the vulnerabilities. Uh, my my focus was on the uh, criticals and highs, as well as the mediums and my counts. And one of the things that uh, that I focus on, and, and I've worked with customers over the years, and, and I share um, out on 
out on the communities is, you know, make sure that you're driving towards something. And, you know, a, a great easy way to, to think about it is a 20% reduction quarter over uh, quarter over quarter to help get you down. You're never going to hit zero. If, if, you, if your goal is to hit zero, you're, uh, I, it's going to be a struggle to get there simply because new vulnerabilities are always coming up and, and things are always uh, coming up after the fact, for example, with, with a dependency. You know, right now there may you may hit zero. Uh, the dependency is has nothing, but tomorrow after you've already released production, something new may be found, and now you have vulnerability. And so, you know, it, it's a moving target. So trying to aim for zero, that's great, um, but I would rather you be ninety percent in in all of your environment than a hundred percent in one and and lacking in the others. All right, uh, let's move along. If your security aims for nothing, you're going to achieve nothing. Checkbox programs are just that, a checkbox. So you need to be proactive. And, and really, this kind of goes back to what I was saying. You need a goal. You need a plan for your program and for what you're doing. Because without a plan or without an actionable goal, you're going to achieve it. You're going to achieve nothing. And that's what you're aiming for. And so this is this is a moment I just want you to just take a pause, think about it, and, and ask the question, what are we doing in our environment? What What is our goal of our program? Do we have one? If not, this may be a good time after the webinar to just take 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and just jot down really high level, really quick, hey, here's the goals of our program. Uh, Johnny and I are going to get into some really good uh, weeds talking about the security wheel and that's coming up. But you know, just be thinking about in the back of your mind as we're talking through this, what can we do to help actually have a goal for the security program? So Johnny, what are you hearing from uh, your AppSec and uh, software engineers today? What problems are you hearing? Yeah, a lot of this has been similar for the last few years it's sort of developed over the last sort of 10 years i would say in terms of alert fatigue we've touched on already so there's a lot of alerts and then you need to prioritize what to leave today so it used to be prioritize what to fix um most appsec teams today have to prioritize what they're not going to fix what they're not going to remediate and, and leave that alone so that's extremely stressful to know that you have a vulnerability that you just can't address. You just don't have the resources to address it. And that mm -hmm. is both AppSec teams and uh, AppSec teams and software engineers. The software engineers just can't get enough time to fix the amount of vulnerabilities they find today. Is that similar? Would you also see the alert fatigue, Chris? We are. We are. And you know, one of the things that, that happens in AppSec programs is they, they have tools, which we're actually going to get into here soon. And the tools are great. The tools are, are, are just that, a tool. And the tool is to help you identify, we have a problem here, we have a problem here, we have a problem here. And the, the problem is you have AppSec teams that are, are receiving the alerts and they just send them over to the developers without any context, without any background, without any without any help. Because one of the things to, to think about or you should be at least focused on is the fact that certain tools, think about your environment, think about where you're working, think about where something executes and runs. If you have a command injection, a, a SAST issue, a command injection is something that you know is dangerous if it's web-based, but if it's on a console application, your environment, you're already on the command prompt, you're already on the computer, doesn't mean or you know as much in that environment when, when you have all the, the facts together. So one of the things to, to consider when, when you're dealing with alert fatigue, make sure you have a developer on your AppSec team, because that will also help your relationship with the uh, software engineering side. Johnny, got any additional thoughts? Yeah, um, that the common theme that we get is just prioritization. I think I, you made a great point, Chris, that that the AppSec tools are just tools. So you kind of need that cultural start. So it's kind of trying to find, what do we say, see the wood for the trees and trying mm -hmm. to know where to start. So 
we mentioned already starting with the highs or the criticals if you've got criticals mm -hmm. um we would find on on we're going to touch on the security wheel um you don't need multiple tools but you do need different tools for different jobs um so sometimes we would see customers some our customers made, who use the das product they would kind of sometimes start with das but that and then they expand into more um mm -hmm. tools as they get as they get going but at the core kind of the three sort of problems that we see that people need help with is just identifying their assets in the first place mm -hmm. to actually know you, you can't actually fix it until you actually know what you have um, and then obviously finding the vulnerabilities in your app is like the core um, job for both of us without without false positives, of course. Right. Um, and then finally helping them. Software engineers especially kind of need help uh, to remediate the vulnerabilities. So depending on how experienced the software engineer is, they might not even know how to remediate a vulnerability yet. Mm -hmm. So it's you know, helping them with even just remediation advice. Yeah. Um, that sort of speeds the whole thing up and kind of helps get the AppSec and software teams together. And like you mm -hmm. said, mixing developers and security teams together is a really, really great step um, to create that culture. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So updating dependencies is like going to the dentist. If you only do it every few years, it's going to hurt. Dependencies is actually part of your development cycle you go out, I need a library or dependency to go do something. Think of the basics, logging, file uploads. I just need to connect and, and do something with, uh, you know, across the internet, uh, talking to APIs, you know, all these dependencies, all these tools that are, that are out there. And what happens is in the past, it's really set it and forget it. As a developer for 35 years, I wrote software. And one of the things that we would run into early on, hey, I need a tool that does X. We go out, we find X, we plug it in, we move on. We don't think about the fact that vulnerabilities appear or, or things eventually happen. And that's one of the things that, um, you know, that this really kind of highlights is, you know, in the security realm, keeping your dependencies updated is really critical because one of the things that I just recently read on LinkedIn is the NVD database is, is behind, so far behind that right now you're in a really bad spot and you're not gonna be notified of vulnerabilities because that it, it's so far behind. And so they call them, you know, everybody's familiar with false positives, but these are false negatives. And a false negative is you have a problem, but you don't realize it because the tool doesn't know how to see it. And the problem is, is, you know, some of the tools out there are, are just tied to the NVD and they can only see what the NVD uh, offers. One of the nice things about the tool sets that we have both over at MEND and, and, and I know Johnny has over on his side is the ability that we, we, we source our information from multiple locations. Because of that, even though with the NVD uh, having the problems that they have, we're fine. We're actually in a good spot. Um, you are going to find and you are going to be notified of, of all the findings, regardless of the fact that the NVD is is behind. And so, uh, uh, Johnny, do you have anything you want to tack on to this before we go to the next slide? Um, yeah, I just think, it's, yeah, updating the dependencies is it's always one of the really, really important steps that you need to do very often, like you mentioned, Chris. Mm -hmm. So um, we've even seen examples where a dependency was absolutely fine when the web app was built and the customer did check it. They did use something like Mendeley for their, their SCA. Um, but as security research moves on and as all open source software moves on, it was in production and it became vulnerable over time and it wasn't vulnerable in the wasn't vulnerable when it left and went mm -hmm. to production, but it has become vulnerable. So it's a really, really good case for maintaining your test and all the time to kind of even the dependencies that you don't think about anymore because they went to production. Um, mm -hmm. It's worthwhile having a, a application security program that will test them frequently. Yes. Yeah. And one of the tools that, that Mend offers is uh, Renovate. And Renovate, what it does is when you have it plugged into your GitHub or your other environments, it has the ability to, when a new update comes out, it just automatically creates a pull request for you. 
It gives you what's called a merge confidence. That merge confidence gives you the ability to know, is this a high confidence that if I take it, it's gonna just slip right in. I still have to get through QA, but I'm gonna be able to just plug and play and go, which is great for low hanging fruit and for prioritization of, of your security issues. Um, the other uh, side of it is if it has a low uh, score, that low score means, yes, you're going to have uh, work to do. You're going to need to plug it in as part of your uh, sprint and, and plan accordingly. So that's, you know, the, the merge confidence is, is, a, uh, is a great feature for uh, helping, uh, you know, decide. So, Johnny, what are the benefits of DAST? Yeah. I would say with DAST, one of the things it's um the key value prop is sort of the same as many AST tools. So number one, you're trying to identify what the customers have to fix, um, find their vulnerabilities, and then help them remediate those in the best way possible. Uh, one thing we would see customers using DAST, it's very, very quick to set up. It's not sort of um language dependent or anything. If you have a web app and you know the URL of that web app, be testing that within a within a matter of minutes, mm -hmm. but but it doesn't it wouldn't always work on its own. Um, I would say that you still need to prioritize, and if you combine that with something like an SCA or a static analysis tool, you can really confirm those findings. So, for example, um, it would be the same as if a tradesman turns up to your house and mm -hmm. in his toolbox all he brings with him is a wrench, or he just brings a hammer you wouldn't really want to work with a tradesman who only uses one tool. And it's the same in application security testing. The different tools are really useful at different stages. So um, one of the benefits of DAST is it can confirm findings that you might've already seen in static analysis. So for example, a SQL injection could be found in static analysis, and then you can actually confirm that SQL injection in the real live web app um, that it does exist there. Um, and mm -hmm. that's definitely something you'd want to address before it went out into production. <laughs> um, yes. It helps you. And it's it's part of that prioritization story, the individual prioritization of if I have 100 different critical vulnerabilities to fix, which one do I fix first? Mm -hmm. um, and if you find a certain vulnerability in a certain web app or, or API is reported by multiple tools, that's certainly one that you want to get addressed and, and get it addressed quite quickly. So we'd see that quite a lot now in AST, people combining results from different AST tools um, mm -hmm. together. Um, whether that whether they do that in a tool to bring all the results together or quite often we would see customers combine them in their CI CD pipeline. So mm -hmm. that's very, very frequent and probably gaining more traction. So um we like with like a Jenkins integration is one of the most commonly used integrations we have, and people are using that in a pipeline where they have SCA and static analysis run before they've compiled their code, um, and then once they've actually built their web app and got it running, they immediately run DAST on it, and that could be anywhere from the local development environment right the way through to sort of pre-prod um environments and even production in certain cases to catch those. So the three of them kind of work together um, really, really, really well um, from what I've seen so far, Chris. Yeah, no, that, that's... Yeah, anything that's... you've seen? Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, what, what about yourself, Chris? What have you kind of seen in terms of uh, the complement of the tools working together? So, so I fully agree. Um, you know, one of the great benefits of DAS that, that are frequently overlooked. You, you have regression testing as part of your pipeline. When you're building your program, you go in, you should have regression testing that goes in and does it. Um, you know, DAST, what it does is it really automates your security testing as well as, you know, your regression testing. So combined, you really kind of put yourself in a good spot. The findings that you find with DAST are very actionable. Um, you know, typically, you know, you're going against a web website or an API or, or, or something that's web-based, and the findings are actual. Uh, the DAS tools will show you, here are the steps that it took to get there. It allows you to go in and, and fix them and just replay that, that portion of the attack that happened you know, for the finding for the DAS. And so I can't underestimate 
um, the, hey, you need to really put, you know, when you start looking at your focus on, on your findings, your SCA or, or your quick hits, your low hanging fruit, those are the ones that you should absolutely be on top of. Your DAS results are next because these are things that actually happen. If I find a SQL injection, there's really a SQL injection. If I find other things, those are actual finds. And so when, when you're looking at them, you, you need to ask your, yourself, and I would test almost in two environments. You, you've got a pseudo production, your UAT, and you have your dev environment. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why I would do your dev is because, or, or a pseudo uh, environment is don't have your guards up. Don't have a web application firewall. See what's actual, see what's out there. And then take a look at your UAT environment. If, if your UAT mimics production like it should, now you're going to have hopefully a WAF up in your web application firewall and be able to know I, I have a finding in the raw area, but that finding is, is covered by my web application firewall. Now, Johnny, I do want to bring up something that, that I've read on LinkedIn, and, and I'm curious what your thoughts are. Um, I, I've read some people saying DAST is dead. Is DAST really dead? I don't think so. What do you think? Yeah, I would say it's certainly it's uh, certainly not. In terms of DAST, kind of where we see there's lots and lots of uh, web apps, of course, which continue to grow. Mm -hmm. um, API security as well is a huge component of DAST. So you see sort of uh, a large focus on API security over the last sort of couple of years, um, especially with the growth of microservices. So we would see a lot of customers would be using the products too scan their APIs. Mm -hmm. So when you think about DAS deep down, a web app really is um, a UI on top of a set of APIs um, stereotypically. Mm -hmm. But API security is just testing that in a headless format. So you test the APIs of your web app. But equally, if you develop um, microservices, mm -hmm. you need to scan the APIs of each microservice. And that's another common sort of CI, CD step that we would say is scanning a microservice. Um, and that way, the development team that's responsible for that individual microservice can scan that in their own development environment with DAST um, and get their own get their own set of results there. So yeah. I, like, I would summarize that DAST sort of clarifies or confirms the test results that you might have already seen from static analysis. Mm -hmm. So if for some reason you ignored it in static analysis, which then you can actually, once it gets confirmed by your second AST tool, it should really, really, really prompt you that this is something you need to, you need to be looking at and uh, something you need to work on yes. before you release that to production, hopefully. Yes. And, and I didn't really go too far in the SAS. The, the SAS is, is, is a definite must have. Um, really all three really are kind of must haves. Was asked, you're finding, do we have SQL injection? Do we have cross-site script injection? Are we able to find different things? You know, and one of the things that you're going to have with, with the SaaS product, and, and, and it's interesting because uh, people say there's a lot of false positives. A finding is really a finding. The question is, is the environment that it's running in. If you're committing your code to GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab, and you're including your web configs or your app configs, those are going to show up and, you know, they're actual findings. And so, you know, a good hygiene practice is just make sure that, you know, when you're committing your source code to your repositories or you're doing your scans, uh, just, you know, look at what's, what's covered in your scan, because if you're going to include development pieces, you're going to get development findings. So one of the things that uh, Johnny and I had in preparation, uh, we talked about this layering is with layering, Think about the different parts of your process. You've got a shift left, you've got a shift right, you've got everything in between. And with your layering, think about the different tools that you can run in, in your early stages of development. Every time you commit code, hey, we can get an SCA scan, we can get a SAS scan. And when you get to the point where you're now doing integration, uh, think about DAST, you know, being able to on the far left, being able to get those results, being able to know where am I? Because honestly, if you go to QA and, and if your QA is part of your security program, which they should be, 
if QA is, is involved with the security, they're going to know, hey, there's new vulnerabilities that have been introduced with this, with this build. The problem is if you're not catching it early before QA, you're wasting their time, you're wasting the uh, automation cycle time. So one thing to make sure that you're you're doing is, um, you know, on the left side, and, and there's everybody's talking about shifting left, but the reality is, is from a development standpoint, if you know you have a finding, fix it. It's a lot easier, quicker, and you're not wasting other people's time. Once you get to production, that changes everything. But the nice thing too is rescan on the other side. By rescanning on the other side, now you're, you know, in the pipeline, you're now bringing together everything for your entire deployable package. When you're scanning in a repo, you're only looking at that instance. You're only looking at that, that sliver. But when you're on the right side and you're looking at your releasable code, your releasable pieces, now you have any dependencies that you brought in, any artifacts that you brought in, you're now including in those scans and also as part of the, the whole security picture. So now you know what do I look like from a whole, and you also know what you look like from, from a development uh, standpoint. Uh, Johnny, you have anything you want to add? Uh, yeah, I would just say like layering your your um, application security testing, kind of like you mentioned, Chris. So so right to sort of start with like your SCA and static analysis first. So typically developers have a lot of pride in in what they produce. So catching that early, um, mm -hmm. a simple SCA check or a simple static analysis may actually catch something really simple really quickly. Even You might even catch it within your IDE before you've even committed the code. Mm -hmm. So that is definitely the cheapest and fastest way to get rid of a vulnerability at source. Um, you don't always know that, or you don't always catch that you maybe introduce something so later on once you've built then I would kind of start to be looking at DAST or, or even IAS and, and API security later on. Mm -hmm. It's really important just to keep them running, sort of keep them running in your yay and environments, Chris. So yes. um, we like what it's one th phrase I've heard is called legacy products. So sometimes very, very high tech companies, a product can become legacy the day it was shipped to production. That's what they term legacy and um, because it's not in active development. So mm -hmm. it's important to keep an eye uh, important to keep an eye on those tools. If you're matured your AST platform or product mm -hmm. to the extent that it only runs in CI C D at that point, well, how do you test the applications that are no longer going through IC through your CI C D pipelines regularly? So you need some sort of a tool in there to kind of keep an eye on things that may be considered not an active development or they haven't been developed for a few weeks or even a few months. So right. Layer, layering all those tools together is great. It's great. And you bring up a good point. You know, one thing that, that happens frequently is an application is built, it's released. It could be a year or two down the road. And if you're not looking at your environment and if you're not staying up to date with the vulnerabilities or the findings that could be out there, you could put yourself in a bad spot. You know, development may, you know, may have ceased. The team may have moved on to other projects, but you're right. You know, vulnerabilities, security issues, they still happen. And, and one thing I wanted to bring up is your, uh, Johnny, as you were speaking, you know, one of the things that a lot of people think about is when they think security, they're thinking, oh, I just created a SQL injection. Oh, I just created this. You know, vulnerabilities are, are bugs and, 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 and um, mm -hmm. mistakes, right? One of the things that, that's actually overlooked is think about your functionality. And that's really where DAS comes in and, and really shines because I may go in and I may have a multi-tenant system where multiple people from multiple companies log into the same UI. My APIs may be written in a way that really I forgot to do um, my check. Hey, the API coming in, the token, you know, the customer that it's, you know, the data is being requested for. If you assume everything is always going to come in for the right, uh, right information, that's how you're going to code it. But the problem is, is if I'm a malicious actor and I'm logging into an API or, you know, looking at the, the data and I'm a man in the middle, I now may take a login credential for myself and start pulling other customers' data. 
And so, you know, making sure that you, you, you're doing these checks are absolutely critical because a developer who's straight out of college isn't going to be thinking about that. That's not one of the things that they learn about. You know, they don't have a class, you know, 500 series class that says, hey, don't forget if you're doing APIs and multi-tenancy to, to include these. These are learned on the job. And tools that we're talking about and, and what we're talking about from a security standpoint, that's included. And, and that's the beautiful thing about having DAST in, in the API security included in your, uh, in your layering of tools is because that's covered. With that being said, let's move on to the security wheel. Um, so the full application security testing, um, the security wheel, right? So you have container security. Um, applications in today's world are now being built on Docker or Kubernetes, and, and they're being built inside of a container. And so having good container security is important, knowing that your, your container itself is clean, the applications and everything you put in the, that container are clean, and you've released it. Um, the SCA and supply chain that, that we've been talking about, making sure that you know any dependencies that you're taking and, and any you know anything that's that's part of your your build process is being is being covered. That that's critical as well as well as SAS. You know, making sure from the left side, making sure these are these are all covered. Johnny, you want to talk about your side? Yep. Certainly, um, the DAS there starting top right in the black sort of segment of the wheel. Mm -hmm. Now, kind of mentioned DAS a couple of times. We would see it kind of in the left, as far left as first time a web app is built. So that could even be locally if someone's testing that. It goes right the way through to mainly pre-production, um, right the way up to whatever you call the environment for production staging or UAT. Mm -hmm. um, we do see folks run it in production, um, not just as frequently, but tend to try and run it in an environment that where you particularly want to test your web app or test your API. And I think, Chris, you referred to this before, tends to be as you go up the environments, the layers of security get deeper and deeper. So mm -hmm. You start to come across WAFs. You start to come across multi-factor authentication or 2FA that's not particularly what you're trying to test with your application security testing. You're trying to test the application itself. Mm -hmm. So like the sweet spot with DAST is an environment where you have good access to the web app or the API, but you don't necessarily want to be testing the firewall or the WAF or, or the multi-factor authentication. That's a different, a different type of testing. Mm -hmm. um, I asked again, I asked you uh, would typically be, same sort of area. So I asked you, you obviously need to have a sensor within your, your application. And it is great when you tag team it with DAST. So you kind of get active. It's like an active check. So part of I asked, you need to um, effectively fuzz or run QA testing on your web app to make sure that all routes through your product are, are exercised. Mm -hmm. um, you can do that by, by having great uh, test coverage. But equally, DAST will do the same job. DAST will actually crawl your whole product. And the good thing about it, it does it automatically. So it doesn't really matter which environment you're in and how many tests mm -hmm. you have. DAST will effectively trigger your IAST. And then that is what we would call proof. It's called proof-based scanning. So if DAST triggers a root and then IAST actually picks up that vulnerability, that would be uh, confirmed that you definitely do have that vulnerability that we hit the sensor. Yeah. And finally, API security is, I mean, it is the bread and butter today. <laughs> it's coming in mm -hmm. further and further and further left. So, right. uh, like I mentioned, microservices, I'd, very, very few people are not building API first these days. Um, so that would be the key thing. And then we focus quite a lot on um, any API, be it a microservice or part of a web app, is kind of where we see that. And the same everywhere from as soon as the API is up and running is the best place to test to catch the vulnerabilities early. Um, and then you may want to test slightly later as well in the, in a staging or a testing environment. Yes. And Johnny, you hit upon it too, the parameter fuzzing and the things that happen with DAST. You know, you may have a UI that's written that takes 20 characters 
But what happens if you put 4,000 characters in? And again, that goes back to, you know, on the back end, good API, you know, if you want to be proactive on your API, make sure you're doing validation of all parameters coming in. And if something's out of out of line, right? If you have a an inbound parameter that should never exceed more than 20 characters and you have more than 20 characters, don't trim it. Just, to, just log the payload. Hey, this was received. This, you know, this fails validation. And, and not only log it, but throw it out. Don't go any further. Don't try to change the data and force it through because if it exceeds the 20 characters or whatever size limit it should be, somebody's being uh, malicious with it in doing things. Uh, looking at the next slide. So we have, uh, you know, full code coverage, you know, looking at, you know, the, you know, everything combined, you know, we have the continuous security where we're, we're creating a no lo uh, low noise and accurate environment. Um, you know, looking at the fast, right. Being able to triage and, and do things and extend your, you know, software supply security chain, you know, looking at everything, you know, combined, you have a really great, picture of what good testing and, and what everything is. You have full left to right. You have all the core uh, aspects of your program. Are there more than just these six? Absolutely. But these are your core six. Um, Johnny, do you have any tips or best practices that you want to throw out? Probably just summarizing a lot of the points that we had before. So tips, obviously, testing as early as you possibly can if you're a developer. Mm -hmm. um, on the more on like the people side and process side, certainly that close champion of a development champion in AppSec and AppSec champion in development, those teams being very very close together mm -hmm. is makes a much more successful program. So regardless of what tools you use, um, if you're working in an environment where you if you're a software engineer and you don't know your AppSec team or vice versa, it makes right. the job much more difficult. Um, you, may, you can sometimes be missing the trust or sometimes missing those steps. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, just remember that um, you're, most people are all in the one team. They're all trying to bring that together and they're trying to achieve one goal, which is just discover what you have, um, discover your, your vulnerabilities on your assets and then Obviously, you want to remediate as many as possible of those severe ones. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say the last the last kind of tip I'd say is don't boil the ocean. Yeah, <laughs> just kind of find out where you're at in your AppSec journey. If if you don't have an AppSec program today, um, pick pick one of the tools and uh, start there. Start to have a look and then build up your layers as time goes on. So mm -hmm. you don't necessarily need to start the whole security wheel on day one and um, right. you kind of pick one and start so start where you are and then just try and progress one step up from where you are today yes well and, and the nice thing and, and this is really a best practice and, and I, I have a few that i'll throw out real quick but you know one thing is this is just reach out to us ask us hey do we have any best practices for our tools because we do and, and i'm and i'm sure johnny you guys have that on your side right Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, we've got anyone at all we can kind of. So, so, so reach out to at. us and, and, and look at, you know, hey, what are the best practices that we suggest and we think about? Another really good practice is, and I mentioned it earlier, is make sure you have a developer on your team, your security team, because that relationship between developers and security is important. You know, if you're siloed and you're fighting each other, you're not going to be working well together. And, and, the, and the problem is, that's where a lot of failures happen. I, I've worked with hundreds of companies over the, the last couple of years. And in the reality, it, it's what I've run into. It's what I see. If you don't have a good relationship between your security team and your developer team, then you're just going to struggle. And, and when you find and have findings, talk through it, talk about it. Don't just throw it over the fence, build that relationship. Johnny, I'm going to move forward uh, because we're kind of you know getting short on time. Um, let's talk about identifying reactive and, and proactive uh, in your security programs, right? So, you know, being in a reactive state, you know, 71%, we, we mentioned this earlier, it's not a good number, right? The context makes it even worse. Think about the following. 
uh, and this is from our, our our studies that we did, and and I know in, in talking uh, prior to this, you know, you had similar findings. Seventy percent of all organizations have directly encountered at least one serious incident. This is seventy percent, and this is over just one year. Think about when you when you look bigger than that. When you think about what else is out there, so you know this is seventy percent. What are the thirty percent doing right? Um, data breaches, you have, you know, an increase from 2022 of 78%. Attacks are, are, you know, being made and your application security, you know, is just not a priority. And what, what's happening with Reactive is you're just getting slammed. You're getting stuff all the time handed to you. And, hey, this is going on and this is going on. And you're going from one fire to the next. And, and really, um, and, and I'm going to talk about a proactive state here in a minute, but one of the things that Johnny and I really are trying to bring to you guys is take a step back, look at the whole picture. Johnny said it right. Focus, get a tool, get started with that tool. Focus on the low-hanging fruit type items, doing what you can to achieve success. Because if if you're firefighting, you're, you're, you're going to struggle to to move the mountain. But when you start shipping away at that mountain, the mountain's moving. It, it's just going to take time to get there. But you can pull yourself out of a reactive and, and move yourself to a proactive state. And that looks like the developers are now communicating to the security team asking for advice. Going back to what we were saying, if you have a good relationship between developers and security, they're gonna, the developers are going to reach out and say, hey, and, and I had this when I was running my program. What is a good locking mechanism for a cell phone? Is a thumbprint acceptable to unlock the application? My development teams were thinking about mobile and thinking about security. That's a great place to be in. That's a proactive state. And you know your security team, they know the current risks and management knows the current metrics. Where do we stand as a company? Make sure the board of directors even has all this information. And your CISO, everybody's involved. If you don't have that going on, you're in a reactive state. Uh, you know, the vulnerabilities, they're known. You have plans to address them and, and time to fix them is quicker because you already have plans put in place. And your zero vulnerabilities, your log for J's, your spring for shells, when those happen, you already have a plan. You have a playbook, you have things in action and, and things ready to go. Johnny, did I miss anything? Does this cover pretty well? Yeah, absolutely. I would say that's the six key points and then just make sure that you can scale as well and, and automate. So I think whatever program you design, it needs to scale the size of your organization. So um, you need to be addressed. Your prior, you need to prioritize your business critical assets mm -hmm. and you need to be able to scan them and then be a bit as you mentioned, proactive and um, probably the best way to be proactive is, is automate as much as possible so that you, you don't have to, you can focus on remediation rather than actually running scans. Yep. So Johnny, where do you see AI and AST? Cool. It wouldn't be a webinar without an AI question. So, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, absolutely. So a AI, I think it's, I think it's a huge opportunity. I mean, obviously, there's a risk there. So there's a there's a risks in that code generated by AI. At the moment, it can be relatively basic. Um, you could almost equate it to sort of uh, later stage college leavers, sort of early career software engineers. Mm -hmm. Um, so it does produce vulnerabilities, and then unfortunately, because it works extremely well, extremely fast, mm -hmm. um. It produces those vulnerabilities faster. So that's a bit of a risk from it that it produces vulnerabilities. But I see it also just as an opportunity. Like the tools that exist today already spot and detect mm -hmm. vulnerable code, be that in uh, code that was written by AI or code that was written by a human. It doesn't, doesn't really matter who wrote the code. So like there is an opportunity there that AST tools already deal with this. Mm -hmm. But also AI, we we see opportunity to use it help with all the the kind of the problems that we said earlier in the webinar like prioritization of of what to fix first that's a prime example where ai could come in and help us prioritize what to fix first right what about yourself chris any sort of thoughts on ai 
Um, yeah, it's uh, AI. It's it, it's an exciting uh, it's an exciting time as as a developer, and and I have some projects that I play with from time to time, and and I work with companies frequently, and we talk about AI. AI is is really it's bringing you forward, and if you're not embracing AI, you're kind of going to fail. And the reason why is because it can really leapfrog your 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 development time and 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 shorten it dramatically. Take simple things, ask AI, ask the Chat GPTs and, and the copilots, you know, and that's really what it is. It's a copilot. Don't treat it like it's you know. Even though Devin just came out. Devon is never going to replace a, a human developer. But the reality is with AI, it's going to generate code for you. Who knows where that code came from? So the problem that you're running into with AI is, is licensing. Was it taken, you know, what model was used to generate your response? Was it from something that had a restrictive GPL license type? That's a problem. And, and the other thing too is uh, AI doesn't really consider security. And so when, when you're looking at the results from AI, it's just giving you an answer. And you can ask AI, generative AI, 20 times the same question. And it's like asking 20 different people. You're going to get a different response most of the time. And so when you're looking at AI and you're looking at AST and, and, and uh, you know, uh, solutions, you know, make sure that you have a solution that, that really took you know, if, if you're going to have AI as part of your remediation suggestions, you know, make sure that you're actually um, getting reliable results. And 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 I, I'm going to say it: Stack Overflow developers copy and paste from Stack Overflow all the time. Look at the results coming from these tools, and ask the question: Is this the right uh, solution? Is this the right way to 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 achieve what I'm looking for? Nine times out of ten, probably. But, you know, just treat it with a grain of salt, treat the results, treat the, the information as, hey, this is beneficial, this is helpful, and what can I do with that? Um, Johnny, do you have any more, uh, any last things? If, if not, we can wrap up. We do have two questions that, that came in during this conversation that, that we're going to ask here in a minute. Oh, yeah, sure. Let's jump straight to the questions, Chris. All right. Very good. So, guys, I, I, I want to say, you know, thank you for uh, joining us on today's webinar. Um, we do have two questions that, that came in. And if, if you have any questions, reach out to Invicti, reach out to Mend. We we, we have, uh, you know, websites and, and URLs and things to go to that we couldn't absolutely answer your questions. Um, you know, any question that comes in after uh, we wrap up, because we are very short on time, we've exceeded actually. Um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll answer in an email. And I do want to say one thing real quick. Uh, I just actually yesterday started and launched a new community on Slack. It's called App Sec Hive, A P P S E C H I V E. Come find the channel, uh, send out a request, and we'll bring you in. This is conversations that we talked about here. We're actually doing over there as well. And so we have a, uh, a great start to it. All right, question one. This is for you, Johnny. Where do you see DAST evolving next? Straight back to the AI question. I think will you AI will become extremely significant, mm -hmm. both in terms of everybody, not everybody, but many, many people are using AI within their web apps. Mm -hmm. So number one, we need to we need to secure those web apps, make sure that LLMs or any form of AI is not introduced a new vulnerability. But equally, we will use AI to help us. So um, very, very much AI will help us automate um, and speed up some processes, help us make some predictions of, of vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. DAST in particular, I can just see it become more and more automated and integrated. So we, I think people will start to scale the programs up. So typically, you start by securing your business critical assets, and then you want to scale out from there. Right. It's just identifying what is business critical. And then exactly. And then the big big part is obviously with this webinar with you, Chris, it's obviously merging the results together and comparing results from different AST tools. So mm -hmm. most customers, as they mature, have multiple AST tools. Make sure they all work together and make sure you can analyze the results and then finally apply a lot of risk, a lot of risk based intelligence. So like vulnerable what typically we call vulnerability management or risk management that kind of brings all those results together and then helps helps a um 
AppSec practitioner decide what needs to be fixed first and help them prioritize, try to really, really help automate um, the boring bits of the job um, mm -hmm. and try and help people by giving them tools that kind of make their job a bit easier and that leaves them freer to do high value work. Right. So I think that's probably the future for DAST. Um, yeah. I just saw there's another question, Chris, I think it's probably more for you. Um, yes. I just heard about the NVD and the delays happening there. What's your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I kind of alluded to it earlier. One of the things that we have uh, recently found out is the NVD has, um, they're way, 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 way behind. I mean, several thousand behind. And so what's happening is there's findings that are known but the problem is, is uh, certain tools are focused only on NVD data. The tools that are only focused on NVD data are going to miss those. And that's, and that's kind of what I was alluding to earlier with the false negatives, mm -hmm. uh, where you actually have a problem, but you don't realize it because the tool can't notify you. And, and again, that's kind of the nice thing about MEND is we do have tools. Uh, our SEA uh, system does source from multiple locations. So we do know more about what's going on beyond just what the NVD has to offer. The other thing too, is we have a tool called Renovate and using Renovate, it will always keep your dependencies up to date. Whenever a new version comes out, it does a pull request for you and, and gives you the information. The real big benefit of, of using a tool like Renovate is you're not getting into technical debt because you're staying current with your, with your uh, dependencies. The other thing too is, all right, so what's the NVD going to tell you? Hey, a dependent, you know, a vulnerability has been found. You need to upgrade. Well, guess what? If you're upgrading already, you're ahead of the curve. This is being proactive. And this kind of goes back to making sure that you have a, a proactive state. And really dependencies are a low hanging fruit. Um, there's a lot of compromises that happen and those are tied directly to dependencies. So keeping your dependencies up to date, when a finding happens, one of the things that happens before somebody submits something to the NVD is they notify the author. They notify somebody and say, you've got a problem with your application or with your, with your library. This gives them a chance to fix it. So by the time it becomes something notified, there's a solution already in place. And the only time that you run into where you don't is if the open source team is no longer managing or, or working on that, that, that open source library. Tools like, uh, you know, Renovate will tell you that, you know, hey, you now know that, you know, after a given amount of time, you've got a dead code. You've got, you know, a, a group that's no longer managing something and you should be looking at where do we move to? What should we be doing? That way you're still staying in something that's being managed because if you're working on a dependency or using a dependency that's not currently being uh, supported, when they have a finding, nobody's there to fix it. And so just keep that in mind. With that being said, guys, I appreciate your time um, spending uh, with Johnny and I today. We, we've had some great conversation. This has been a great campfire chat. We, we've brought you a lot of good information. There, there's still so much more out there that we haven't even touched base on. Uh, again, we, we didn't have time to get to all the questions. We're going to take the questions that came in and we're going to reach out and, and, and answer them. With that being said, uh, Thank you so much. Yeah, great chat. Great chat, Chris. It was great great talking to you. And if anyone needs to follow up on the Invicti parts that we mentioned, you can visit them on Invicti.com. That's I-N-V-I-C-T-I.com. You can get things like free trials and demos all on the website or and follow up with us. And we will get back and answer your questions along with Chris. It was great, Chris. Thank you very much for the conversation. I'll talk to you soon. It's been great talking to you. Uh, and we're mend.io, M-E-N-D.io. Thank you.